I'm here today with Rebecca Trimble. She was adopted as an infant in 1989. She grew up in the Pacific Northwest and considered herself a regular all-American girl. But over two decades later, as she prepared for her honeymoon, her life was turned upside down when she came to the realization that not only is she not an American citizen, but the government says she doesn't even belong in the United States at all. Joining me from Bethel, Alaska, is Rebecca and her husband, John, to discuss her situation, how this happened, and their fight to keep her in the country. Welcome. Where, Rebecca, did you grow up? Now, I grew up in uh, Salem, Oregon. When did you first find out that you were adopted? Probably around five or six. Just some neighbor kids that were teasing me, you know, that I had looked different and such. And, uh, you know, I didn't look like my parents. As a kid, I guess you don't really think about, you know, skin color or anything. And so they sat down and said, yes, I was adopted. Now, growing up, there was no issues with getting a driver's license, going to college, and they accepted you, and you just kept assuming you were a U.S. citizen. You had a Social Security card, right? Correct. Now, I understand you voted in the 2008 election. My senior year in high school, and um, it was like a political government class. We would just, you know, watch debates on during school and uh, just talk about you know, world politics in general. And um, the teacher just had encouraged us to uh, register to vote. And, and you did? Yes. When did you find out that you were not a U.S. citizen? So before John and I got married, we were talking about for our honeymoon, we wanted to do a road trip. And so I went to go get an enhanced driver's license, which is kind of like a bordering state to like a country take like Canada, Washington to Canada, or, you know, California to Mexico. And when I went there, she said that I didn't have the right paperwork. And I said, what do you mean I don't have the right paperwork? This is what I have. And this is how I got my driver's license, you know, and she's like, I need a naturalization paper. And I was like, well, what's that? And she's like, Just go find out yourself. You know, I got people in line behind me. So, yeah. So you went to your parents and you said, hey, Where's my naturalization certificate? What'd they say? They had no idea what that was either. Okay. So when did you guys get married? Uh, in 2012. All right. You have children? Yes. Two. Two. How old? Five and four. Okay. Very cute. And how did you guys meet? Uh, in high school. High, high school. school high school sweethearts? Now, Becky, what do you do for a living? Do you work right now? Um, I just take care of the kiddos at home. And then I'll occasionally during the summer do a shave ice stand that we do. Yeah, and I also understand that you help the homeless in your church. Yes, yeah, so I uh, help coordinate meals during the winter for the homeless. So at what point now do you say, all right, I got to deal with my wife's immigration issue? When did you guys start to deal with it? Well, I mean, we, we tried to deal with it as soon as we reasonably could. So she found out uh, a few months before we got married. And I mean, honestly, at the time when I found out, I was kind of, I thought it was kind of ridiculous, you know, because I, I knew she had been here since she was a baby, you know, and I was like, how can this, you know, is this real? Is this real? You know, like, are we really going to have to, it seemed like it would be an easy fix right, to me right. at the time, you know. So how'd you move from Washington to Alaska? I went to, I went to dental school uh, in 2013 in Portland, and then I got a, I got a scholarship um, for the last three years of dental school that was a, uh, like a federal scholarship through the National Health Service Corps. In order to pay back the scholarship that you get, you have to work in an underserved area. So I just ended up getting a job up here in Alaska. And I understand you're also uh, in the Army Reserves as well. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what did you do next? We just happened to move next to a accredited representative's office, like Lutheran Community Services Northwest. Mm -hmm. And so I went in there and talk to the accredited representative and then we this kind of got- a, This was not a lawyer. This was just- Not a lawyer. Just not a lawyer. somebody who has access to immigration lawyers and who like helps people who don't have enough money for a lawyer is essentially what it is. She helped us put a bunch of applications together. And this was in 2015. We went through several applications that kept getting denied for various reasons. And then in 2017, we moved up to Alaska 
And at the time, we we were waiting on our pending I-485 application. We filed an adjustment of status application based on Yeah, it. we filed that in, I believe, 2016. And that was done in Washington State or in Alaska? Uh, it was done in Washington State. And then I guess when you moved to Alaska, you changed your address and they, they moved the case up to Alaska. Yes. Right. Which is why think, probably yeah. it took so long because people who watch my show know this. When you move from state to state and you change your address when your case gets up to the new state, it goes to the end of the line as if you just refiled it from the beginning. That's why when you move from one state to the other, you went to the back of the line of where whatever the adjustments were in Alaska. I see. Okay. So I was, we were waiting around for a long time. Um, I, I would check on the application every once in a while and it would be under review perpetually. You know, Basically, it had been under review for so long that I, I reached out to one of the senators in Alaska to try to get it to start moving, you know. And she tried to help us, but it didn't work at all. And then in, I believe, August of 2019, I hired our... So, so we're now three years into a pending adjustment with still no answer. Yeah. And you, yeah. And you have an interview at all? We had an interview uh, right before we moved to Alaska. So in okay. June of 2017, we had an interview. Right. She talked to us about Becky's voting issue. Okay. Yeah, and then we moved. So we moved a month after the interview, and then... That was kind of all we heard from them for about two years. And then in August of 2019, um, we hired our attorney. She didn't want to file a lawsuit right away. She said it was a odd case. She said she couldn't promise any results, but she recommended that we do not file a lawsuit immediately. She wanted to try to kind of move along slowly. She wanted to talk to USCIS in person herself. I believe she met with them twice and they were unreceptive to, you know, her. So it kind of moved along pretty slow. And then we got the, her denial on the I-485. And that was it's like three and a half years after we filed it. Why did they deny it? They denied it because she had voted uh, in 2008. She voted in, in an election. They claim she made a false claim to U.S. citizenship. Right. And that is why she can't get her green card. The fact that I understand there's no record of actually where you were born. The government, even if they wanted to deport you, can't deport you anywhere because let's assume the government says you're from Mexico. We don't even know if you're from Mexico or not, but let's assume the government says you're from Mexico. Mexico has to accept you and say yes and agree you're a citizen of Mexico, but there's no record of your birth there. So the government just can't dump you off in Mexico just because they say you're Mexican. So there's lots and lots of people in the United States of America who have actually been ordered deported, but are stateless people. The government can't prove where they were born. So the worst case scenario would never come true, which is no one's going to be taking, you know, your wife away from you. So what did you do next? So then I emailed my attorney. She had me call her. I talked to her on the phone. I told I was kind of mad because they were threatening to deport my wife who had been here whole life to a foreign country. She she told us that we the next step would be to file a motion to appeal the decision. So we did do that. Motion to reopen. Yes, a motion. Yeah, motion to reopen. They they did deny that. By the way, they denied the motion I, to reopen as well. Yeah, they did. Before that, I didn't feel threatened, and then when they sent that denial letter in February, I, I did feel threatened. Uh -huh. So I said to myself. Nobody's going to come take my wife without other people knowing about this story, essentially. So I contacted the reporter in Anchorage. He puts together a story. And then about two weeks later, he published it. I mean, that's kind of that's kind of what started this yeah. game of events, you know. Mm -hmm. So what did you do next? After they denied the motion to reopen, our attorney said that we've exhausted our administrative options. Now we can file a federal lawsuit, is what she said. So we've been kind of preparing a, the lawsuit. But then in the meantime, we heard that Representative Don Young from Alaska was going to introduce a private bill to the House of Representatives. So that's kind of what we've been focusing on so for the last waiting, little bit. So you've been waiting on a private bill. Obviously, a private bill solves everything. So if, in fact, the private bill goes through and it passes the Senate and the House or whoever the president is at that time, signs it, then yeah, then that resolves your problem. I would say this though, when you are denied for a false claim for US citizenship, you have to knowingly make a false claim. In other words, you have to know that you're not a US citizen and that you're saying it, despite knowing you're not a US citizen, you're saying you are a US citizen. And you have to say it to get a benefit, which is to vote, uh, to get a driver's license perhaps, 
to get a U.S. passport. If you believe yourself to be a U.S. citizen, that's not a false claim to U.S. citizenship. You told the truth. I thought I was a U.S. citizen. That's a truthful claim to U.S. citizenship. You're just in error. And there's a big difference. So when the government denies you for false claim for U.S. citizenship, they have to deny you and say you knew you were doing something wrong. And as a result of that, you're not entitled to a green card. Based on the facts that you just told me in this interview, there was no false claim to U.S. citizenship. It was a truthful claim to U.S. citizenship and you were in error, which is not a reason to deny your green card. As a matter of fact, you were adopted when you were an infant. So why would you even think that you weren't a U.S. citizen when your parents are telling you you are? Immigration made an error, either purposely or not purposely. And I'll tell you why I think sometimes they make errors purposely. Because it's a lot easier to deny you than it is to approve you. Because nobody gets in trouble if Becky doesn't get a green card. But if they give a green card to somebody who broke the law, then heads roll. And since they're unsure themselves of what the law is, they're going to make the error, if they're going to make an error, on the side of denying you instead of approving you, and immigration does this all the time. And you should know you got nothing to fear because they can't send you anywhere. <laughs> yeah. They can't deport you. They can't send you anywhere. You're a stateless person. There's no proof of where you're from. So even if they wanted to deport you, they couldn't. So ultimately, I, I would feel very comfortable that ultimately, if you follow that advice, you would get through. Okay. How does it feel to know that there's no record of where you're born? Yeah, I feel like I'm uh, in limbo, you yeah. know, kind of like unwanted or in some ways like that or just not cared for anywhere, I guess. Becky, what is your American dream? I would love to just be able to travel, um, to just not have um, limits and to just support where I'm from and on many different levels, you know, like my community, you know, or my friends and family, my state, just, uh, yeah. Just to be happy, married, and raise my kids here. And John, what is yours? I'm already living it. Yeah. Except, except this little, this little nightmare that follows you around. Yeah, right. that, that'll, yeah. that'll, that'll be fixed as well. Well, thank you very much. You're gonna, I think ultimately you're going to be fine. And I'm sure that if you have congressmen and senators taking up this case, that there will be a private bill. But just know, if not, what your next step would be. What's happened to you is extraordinarily, extraordinarily unfair. I'm confident based on what I've heard that everything's going to work out for you. Yeah, I'm, hope I'm very hopeful. Yeah. Becky and John Trimble, thank you for coming on. Good luck and uh, thanks for coming on. Awesome. Thank, thank you, sir. You. Thanks for watching. For more Bradshaw Live, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.